what's called the 1980s, the Aboriginal Land Rights Movement was one of the strongest political movements in this country. Extraordinarily effective, making international impacts, freaking out Australian governments, forcing Australian governments to negotiate the Then, along comes the silver bodgy fight. <laughs> the dodgy bodgy, I prefer to call him, played by the name of Bob Hawke. And Bob Hawke came to power, you will recall, declaring to anyone who would listen, well, he declared publicly extensively, he said, my government will deliver national uniform land rights legislation to Aboriginal people all over Australia, along the lines of the 76 Northern Territory Act, in other words, free old title, and if the state premiers want to win you about it, then we will introduce you, we will override their legislation with Commonwealth legislation. This was the high point for the Aboriginal political movements. We couldn't believe our ears. And it was all, it all looked really positive. It looked as though finally we were going to get justice. But then, folks, another really important person in the history of the Australian Labor Party, the filthy, rotten, corrupt scumbag Mate of the developers in Western Australia, the West Australian Premier, uh, Premier Brian Burke, then the National President of the ALP, gets on the phone to Bob Hawke from Perth, says, get your ass over here, Hawke. Bob goes racing off to Perth because Bob, uh, uh, because uh, Brian Burke, after all, is the biggest fundraiser in the ALP, with all these dodgy developer mates like Laurie Connell then, that's why he was, you know, making so much money for the ALP. Bob goes racing across, Brian Burke says, listen here, Bob, <laughs> what about the mining industry and what about the castles here in Western Australia? Brian Burke surreptitiously, in his classic style of being, a, being, a, being you know, an advocate for the bloke with the biggest paycheck, Brian Burke convinced Hawke in one meeting that this would be to the detriment of the Australian mining industry and like uh, Richard uh, suggested, I think, uh, this came after a, a massively funded public relations campaign, almost identical to the one done again recently by the miners. The mining industry suggested that, you know, the grand Aboriginal land rights wouldn't be to destroy the Australian economy. They had the most racist television campaign you've ever seen. Uh, Joseph Goebbels would have been turning in his grave with envy. <laughs> Bob Hawke, being the compliant little body that he you know, was, said, no worries, Brian. I'll fix it. And Bob Hawke, without consulting the party, without consulting any of his cabinet, cabinet colleagues, overnight declared that national uniform land rights legislation was off the table. End of land rights. Brian Burke, Bob Hawke killed land rights. Not John Allen. Bob Hawke, Brian Burke. ALP. Right? So what did we end up with when, when Hawke and Keating finally left office? Well, we ended up with this thing called native title, the most inferior form of land tenure under British law. Ain't really worth a pinch of shit when it comes down to it. It ain't land ownership. Native title is not land rights. In the same way, reconciliation is not justice. Reconciliation. Let's uh, have a look at reconciliation. You know, like while we're, while we're uh, dispensing with a few of the beloved myths of white Australia at the moment, everybody's embracing this thing called reconciliation. Let's remember where reconciliation come from. How did reconciliation come onto the national agenda? Did it come as a spontaneous, genuine, heartfelt response from either the, either the white community or the Aboriginal community? No way! White fellas weren't screaming out for reconciliation. Black fellas certainly weren't screaming out for reconciliation. In the lead up to the 1988 masturbation of the nation, the bicentennial, in the lead up to 1988, after Bob Hawke backed off land rights in 1986, we made it clear that we were going to do damage to his bicentennial big party, you know? And so Bob Hawke, in fear of what Aboriginal activists might do, given what we'd done at the 1982 Brisbane Games against Joe Jockey Peterson, made world headlines, huge demonstrations, mass arrests, Bob Hawke was genuinely terrified of what we might do. So what did he do? And he said, oh, I must... I must appease, I must sort of, you know, try and calm down some of these back on, try and divide them all, see if we get, you know, a bit of a split there so they don't look so united, so they're not going to fuck up my party. So my picture's going to be on page two or page one of the New York Times. And so, he said, right, what do we do? I know, we'll build a car. And so the Hawke government announced 
They were going to build a car, a committee of Aboriginal reconciliation. It came into being as an act of parliament, not a genuine, spontaneous uh, sentiment on the part of your community or ours. It came, into, it came into being, the concept, as a deliberate, cynical ploy by the Hawke government to somehow or other undermine you know, the resolve of Aboriginal people who were threatening to demonstrate in 1988. They also banged on a, a Royal Commission, a $50, $50 million Royal Commission, into Aboriginal deaths in custody because that was a major issue at the time. And yet there seems to be... There were, and the primary finding of that Royal $50 million Royal Commission was that the reason so many black people were dying in jail because there was so many black people in jail. So Aboriginal people are the most jailed people on earth. And yet here we are, what, 20 years after the Royal Commission, and there are more black people in jail today than there were then, you know? Thanks to... Anyhow, yeah, thanks... To, and that one's thanks to an ALP person too. I think it's uh, the first female ALP president, uh, Carmen Lawrence, better known as the person who introduced that lunatic nutcase American concept into Australia called mandatory sentencing. Three strikes and you're out. Uh, a concept and an idea and a law that has put more black fellas and poor people in jail than virtually anything else in the last 20 years. So let's not, you know, let's not, uh, just because we're here in the trade hall, uh, get all fuzzy and love, love them to the trade union movement and the ALP and all the rest of them. The ALP, in my experience, in my opinion, has done more damage. The governments of Whitlam, Hawke and Keating, in the final analysis, have done more damage to Aboriginal people and Aboriginal interests than any of the Conservatives, including John Howard, including Mal Brock, including Amanda Vanstone and all the rest of them. So where does that leave us? If the people who we know, the Conservatives, we know, we've always known, since I was 17 years old, I've known that the Conservatives hate us and they'll do anything that they can to screw us. Most through most of my life, the Conservatives have always said that to my face. And I've understood that. I can cop that. I'm happy if somebody will say, OK, we hate you, and we're going to do this year. Fair enough, mate. No worries. You try and do it. <laughs> but, you know, at least they have the honesty to tell us that they don't like us, they're opposed to everything we want and all the rest of it. The ALP, on the other hand, pretend to be our friends, and then do the dirty ones, e.g. continuation of the intervention, you name it, mate. They've given us a native title which was considerable back, you know, a considerable step down from what we were talking about, what we almost got in 1986, land rights. You know, you didn't see people marching down the street in the 70s saying, native title was there. <laughs> I walked down the street and said, land rights down! No, that's what I was saying. 